we are very happy to have with us one of the most influential researchers in empirical asset pricing and mutual funds, Robert Stambaugh from Wharton. Um, he will give introductory remarks and sort of set the stage for today's topic. So Robert, I'll turn it over to you now. You have about 15 minutes. Great, thank you, Lars. Uh, so um, you know, as Lars mentioned, the topic today is mutual funds, which is an incredibly broad area in finance, uh, very heavily researched. You know, if you, if you do a Google Scholar search on mutual funds, you'll get uh, either millions of hits or, or, or many thousand, depending on how, how uh, finally you, you uh, narrow this, the, uh, the search. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons is because this is an area where we've had rather abundant data for a long time, particularly in terms of looking at professionally managed money. Uh, you know, the mutual fund area has been the one area where we have uh, much better data than, than uh, you know, other, other sectors of uh, professional money management. And, um, you know, there are really two topics that uh, I thought I'd touch on today. I'd, I'd hope was to try to sort of give some broader perspective, I think, on mutual fund research because it's just, just so much of it. Um, so I thought I would just, uh, you know, use the two papers today, the, the topics uh, that those papers um, take up and, uh, you know, just give you some of my thoughts, the, the things that these, these, these papers have sort of brought to my mind. Um, first topic is on benchmarks and, and, uh, and measuring performance. And the second is on fund flows and the relation to uh, asset prices. Um, so first on benchmarking, you know, I, I, I guess we should sort of take as the objective here, or presume that we want to, in benchmarking, want to control for effects that are not uh, reflecting managers' skills. Um, you know, whether what you have left does reflect skill is a separate topic for debate elsewhere, right? Of course, there, there's, you know, one strand of literature that says, well, you know, performance relative to some benchmark isn't going to tell you about skill either, but, but um, I think at the very least, whatever performance benchmark we construct, you know, one objective we have for it is that it controls for things that, that uh, I suspect we can all agree are not reflective of skill. Um, and you know, the, the controls here, there are a number. What, one of the first ones, of course, that we've talked about for many, many years is controlling for risk, right? If you're controlling uh, for risk, you're not then allowing risk differences to affect performance. Um, and, you know, it's somewhat related to that, but not necessarily the same as controlling for style, right? Because we think like, you know, a, say a value style versus a growth style um, need not be a risk-based thing. It could be, but maybe not. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that traditionally we've controlled for. Um, and then you can get into other sorts of controls that I think are maybe more controversial, but I think many would say are also things that we should try to uh, allow for. Things like trading costs, for example, if you're you know, evaluating a, a momentum fund and uh, you want to benchmark it. Um, if you simply use some before cost momentum return, uh, I think we'd all agree that's probably not an apples to apples comparison because momentum strategies in particular are uh, somewhat costly to trade. Um, and then, you know, there's an additional set of what uh, this first paper called mandates and constraints. And here I've, I've listed some that, uh, that this paper mentions things like constraints on liquidity of the fund. You know, what's the what's the universe of investments that it can undertake? Uh, what restrictions are there on short selling? Um, are there constraints on how much the fund can borrow, or how much cash it needs to have or not have? And also, you know, things like turnover. Um, and um, and this first the first paper today uh, sort of takes the approach that we can control for all these uh, in a way that's sort of in a bespoke manner. That is, in some sense, it's a almost a fund specific benchmark that incorporates these various mandates and constraints um, so that you do get more of an apples to apples comparison of the fund performance to some, to some benchmark. And, um, and what they find here, I think very interesting is that, is that when you do that, um, you generally get improved performance. And, and of course, this, this gets to the, to the heart of a, of, a, of a puzzle that's been around for many, many decades, going back to you know, Mike Jensen and uh, his 68, uh, PhD dissertation that when you look at the uh, the performance of funds, um, uh, at least net of fees, you know, net of, net of all costs and fees, you get typically negative benchmark adjusted performance. And this has been a sort of repeated theme throughout many empirical studies over the years. Um, and uh, I think it's interesting that this paper says, well, if you, if you do things a little more carefully in terms of uh, controlling for these additional factors that uh, 
that things change on that, on that benchmark adjusted basis. This idea of mandate sort of brought to mind uh, something that um, I'll call sort of the mushrooming mandate. And that's kind of this, this move towards sustainable investing uh, that is taking account of uh, environmental, social and governance, so-called ESG criteria in, um, in investing. Um, yeah, we all know this, is, this has been very prominent in, in, in news lately. You know, BlackRock, the world's biggest money manager, sort of announced its adoption of, of ESG um, integration and its investing. Um, you know, Morningstar actually called, called 2019 kind of a tipping point here. They noted that uh, the flows in the sustainable U.S. mutual funds were actually 400 percent higher in 2019 than the previous year. And uh, if you look at uh, the total size of this activity, you know, over two years, you had uh, by over a one third increase in, in global assets that are managed in a sustainable uh, fashion. And um, I think the question of benchmarking this stuff is just really in its infancy. You know, how do you, how do, you do this? How do you benchmark sustainable investing? Uh, be, presumably there's a return, or a financial return component, as well as a sort of an ESG performance component. You know, how well does the fund achieve any kind of ESG goals or mandates? Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that complicates this is that these mandates are often pretty imprecise. You know, how strong is the mandate? Uh, what what weights are given to E, S, and G? And of course, that can be time varying. You know, for, for many years, I think E was the the the, the prominent uh, aspect, the environmental part. I think this year has taught us that probably the social part of it's going to get much more importance. Um, and the other just complications, you get disagreement across stock ratings put out by you know a bunch of the the major providers of the stuff that I've listed here. So I think this, this idea of trying to control for various aspects of investment mandates is only going to get more important uh, as, a, as a sustainable investing uh, grows. And um, this sort of brought up some questions in my mind about, about this whole idea of bespoke benchmarks, right? You, because particularly when you think about this, this area of sustainable investing, you're going to get potentially many disparate bespoke benchmarks. Um, in some sense, each fund is going to have its own, you know, tailored bespoke benchmark. Um, and that means, that, you know, if you're an investor thinking about choosing a fund, in some sense, you're choosing, you're choosing the mandate or choosing the, you know, the benchmark that goes with that mandate, and you're choosing the fund sort of simultaneously. So I think the question, to what extent is this benchmark adjusted performance then going to be useful to investors, right? Because you, you may have an investor might think, well, um, this fund didn't achieve its, achieve benchmark adjusted performance as good as that fund, but I like this fund's mandate better, right? I like, <laughs> I like the benchmark that it's being compared to better. So it's almost as if there's going to be this sort of trade-off, right? You, 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 the investors sort of simultaneously look at what is the mandate and of course the, the, you know, the, the accompanying benchmark versus you know, how well does the fund manager achieve that, uh, that performance or that mandate. And um, uh, so I think it may, it's almost like a multi-dimensional choice problem where, where investors are gonna simultaneously be evaluating the mandates as well as how well managers meet them. So you may well decide to go with a, with a manager that performs poorly with respect to his mandate, but nevertheless has a much more attractive mandate than another manager that, that uh, in some sense beat his bespoke benchmark. Uh, and uh, yeah, I haven't thought deeply about these questions, but I think this, this paper and this whole idea of bespoke benchmarks uh, to me raises kind of an interesting set of issues. Um, I thought the, the other paper today uh, talks about mutual fund flows about which has been a ton written, but um, very little of any linking mutual fund flows to asset pricing. I think that's sort of the novel take this paper brings. And just sort of to quickly summarize the idea here so we can, so we can get the idea as to, as to why there's this link. So in a given active manager, Jay's consumption uh, is proportional to the fund's AUM because the, 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 fund, the fee revenue is proportional to AUM and the managers assume just to consume the, the fee revenue. Um, and AUM can change either because of the fund's rate of return or because it gets money uh, contributed or withdrawn, the flow. And uh, this manager is risk averse as it's averse to the variance in the change in AUM. So that's going to mean the manager is going to tend to want to underweight in the investment portfolio of the fund uh, 
stocks that have high covariance of return with the funds flow, right? Because they want to basically lower the variance of the, uh, the sum of the return and the flow contributions. Uh, and then the paper argues, well, there's a lot of commonality across funds in flows. So if we then look at the sort of aggregate flow number, um, you get an equilibrium result where, where, where stocks had high covariance with aggregate flow have low expected return, uh, which is, I think, you know, a sort of a novel link between flows and, 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 and asset pricing. And they provide a bunch of supportive empirical evidence uh, uh, in that regard as well. Um, some questions that kind of arose when I thought about this is, is what, is this a very efficient way to provide fee insurance? So if managers do worry about the, the, the you know, fluctuations in their fee revenue, um, because after all, you think about what this, what this is doing with managers are tilting toward assets with lower expected returns and away from ones with higher expected returns due to this pricing effect they're basically depressing the fund's return relative to what it otherwise have been. But most of the fund's return goes to investors, right? You know, so the, the, the fee rate is only taking a small chunk of that return effect. So is this really efficient for investors who are basically getting most of the return to be bearing the cost of providing this insurance to, to, uh, to managers? And I also wonder about what's the incidence of this risk on managers? Because uh, you know, many, many mutual fund companies, for example, are either uh, as a large group of funds owned privately, like you know, Fidelity by the Johnson family, or you know, T. Rowe Price publicly traded. So you know, ultimately, in the end, who is bearing the the risk and the revenue? Is it really the portfolio managers? Um, is it really is their compensation so tightly linked to the fee revenue of the fund company, or is there uh, sort of a lot of risk bearing happening elsewhere? Um, but to the extent that there, are, that there is a lot of risk bearing directly being done by portfolio managers, I would think, you know, this, this is actually probably stronger for hedge funds, right? So you have hedge fund managers, first of all, they're, they're charging incentive fees. So their fee revenue is, is more heavily linked toward the return. And also they generally have a, a, a much bigger equity stake in the fee revenue um, directly. So, you know, if there is this hedging motive among fund portfolio managers, um, I would think the, the place you might like to, to see it more strongly is, is among hedge funds, um, as opposed to say, you know, large, large fund companies, diversified fund companies. Um, one thing that, that this sort of harkened back to for me was the, this relation between flows and returns. i had seen before in a paper by uh, Akbas Armstrong, Sresky and Subramanium and JFE that, um, so sort of looked at flows in, in relation to how they relate to mispricing. So they, they looked at a composite mispricing measure. This is actually a measure that, that I'd used with uh, Jean Feng Yu and Yu Yuan in some earlier work where they, they rank stocks on this composite measure, you know, form a long and short leg uh, portfolios and look at the returns on these things. Um, and what they found is if you, if you regress uh, these returns on contemporaneous mutual fund flows and aggregate fund flow number, you actually get the, a pretty significant effect. In fact, you get in particular that the, the overpriced stocks, you know, would be the short leg stocks, uh, have significantly positive flow, ba aggregate flow betas. Um, you know, the underpriced negative, but not very significant. Um, and uh, so if you think about what, what sort of stocks funds would be tilting away from, well, you would hope they're tilting away from overpriced stocks <laughs> in addition to stocks that might have a high flow beta. So if empirically we see funds tilting away from these stocks, um, your question is, okay, why are they doing it? Are they doing it because they don't like their, their flow betas due to risk hedging considerations or are they tilting away from them because they're overpriced? Um, and the other interesting dimension of that, of that study was that they found if you look at the lag flow, look at the return regressed on lag flow, the, the signs actually flip, right? So if you're thinking about um, flow betas, um, uh, it seems like the world is not sort of IID, right? There seems to be this interesting lead lag relation. Um, so, um, you know, these are just more or less random thoughts I had in response to both of these papers. and. Uh, since I don't want to overstep my, my time limit here, I will uh, turn things back and uh, yeah, we'll hear from Michael. All right, Robert, thank you so much for uh, a great introduction, uh, really interesting stuff. If you could unshare your slides, there you go.
I think that should set the state stage for uh, Michael. So uh, we're going to the paper now. First paper is 30 minutes. And uh, again, if you have some comments you want to post, use the chat. I'll turn it over to you now, Michael. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I don't think my co-authors joined me today. So if, if there are chat questions, Lars, you know, feel free to just inject them. Um, let me share my slide. And just to double check, when I point at things, you can see that on your yes. end? Yes, Great. I can. All right, so uh, this is a paper um, that's, first of all, let me thank the organizers. Uh, let me thank Rob for um, already uh, doing a great job at um, basically describing the, 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 the simple point of the paper. Um, and at the same time, also getting at kind of the tough spot that I wanna spend some time talking about and, and, and maybe have a discussion afterwards, which is, you know, what, what do you make out of all of this at the end of the day? And, um, you know, particularly about uh, do investors ultimately choose um, the constraints under which their managers operate? And is that not potentially more important than finding the right manager to then uh, implement that constraint? Yes, particularly in the ESG example he gave. Um, so uh, this is a joint paper with Alessandro Baber, um, Jason Sen, and uh, Ken Cavallas. And um, as Rob already described, yeah, the, the basic point of the paper is um, very straightforward, which is that if you open up a prospectus for a typical mutual fund, you'll find in it a lot of details as to the rules of the game, what the fund is allowed to do and not do. And so the point of the paper is very simply that the performance of a manager ought to be done within the context of those rules of the game. Um, and that at times, and, and you know, kind of the main contribution we think of the paper is to illustrate how um, those rules of the game actually can significantly affect um, the potential return that a manager can generate and therefore ought to also um, affect the benchmark to which a manager is either compared or maybe internally um, evaluated. And we'll get to that in, in just a slide or two. Um, let me oh, make sure, let me start with an example. Um, so this is a uh, mutual fund um, prospectus, and um, it's a, a, a capital growth um, fund, which is a particular subset of mutual funds. It kind of lies in between the spectrum of um, index funds, which have relatively little lenient, uh, relatively little freedom to deviate from the index because their primary objective is to um, replicate the index within some tracking error. And on the other side uh, of the extreme, perhaps hedge funds or total um, total return funds that can basically do anything. Um, these intermediate set of funds, which are the ones that we'll end up studying empirically, um, have significant rules around what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do in terms of the index that they're roughly tracking, uh, the industry exposures, the single stock exposures that they may or may not take and so forth. So this is kind of a, an interesting example to study. Um, before we get into the empirical work. Um, so here's the empirical um, kind of experience of this fund. Um, you know, the return um, plotted into expected return or average return in this case, historical um, risk dimension with a four factor efficient frontier in blue and really, you know, the capital market line in red, um, the market being over here. So you see this is a fund that takes a little bit uh, less risk than the market uh, and generates a return that is um, you know, a little bit lower than that of um, the market return and uh, significantly lower than what you might achieve taking the same risk on the efficient frontier. And, and that's sort of the point of traditional um, mutual fund evaluation is to say, well, this, this mutual fund in an ex post context isn't really doing all that well. And, and why is that? And you know, the population is rough pointed out, this is sort of an empirical puzzle um, that after fees, the universe of mutual funds don't tend to be on the efficient frontier. Um, we're gonna take a slightly different view on, on how to measure um, performance and think about it at, from a perspective of excessive risk taking. So for the same average return generated, um, how much more risk does this fund take relative to what uh, it needed to take? And, and the amount of risk it needed to take to be on the capital market line would have been right here. My, well, my pointer is and uh, the difference, the horizontal difference is that underperformance that we talked about. So if you look at that um, prospectus and you start reading it, you know, our thinking is that, you know, we're starting to wonder whether 
the capital market line really is the right and fair comparison to draw. Um, after all, this point right here on the frontier involves a certain amount of risk reborrowing and then uh, a, a further amount of, uh, or an offsetting amount of investment in the maximum Sharpe ratio portfolio, which sits up here somewhere above the market portfolio, probably involving some significant short selling um, and leverage. And uh, those are unfortunately things that the fund is not allowed to do. So one of the things that uh, the perspective is very clear about is that this fund may not borrow, lend cash um, in excess of what is needed for day-to-day, -day, month to month um, flow. So really it's facing um, the blue efficient frontier and you know, maybe the appropriate difference uh, to, to analyze is you know, the difference between the fund's average performance and that frontier. But it turns out the fund's not allowed to short sell either. So uh, we need to instead construct that efficient frontier with a no short sell constraint. Uh, the fund also has to be well diversified. Um, it cannot hold more than 5% of its assets in a single name. Um, so that gives us yet another frontier. And um, finally, the fund's sector composition. So the amount of assets deployed in industrials versus consumer discretionary versus financials or healthcare, et cetera, has to roughly match that of the index within certain bounds, um, which we can um, measure. And so you know, that further changes the efficient frontier. And so the point of the paper very simply is that when you're looking at a particular mutual fund, um, and we're looking at this one, for example, um, the efficient frontier to which you wanna compare it in order to determine whether or not this mutual fund uh, manages to outperform um, given its mandates uh, depends on the specific constraints and mandates of that particular manager, which in this case would be the turquoise line instead of the red line, um, we would argue. So um, the basic question um, or point of the paper then is um, that if you look at two funds, they will have different prospectuses that will line up, line out, outline different sets of rules of the game. And therefore, since no two funds are the same, um, the benchmarks to which you then want to compare them or might want to compare them um, should also not be the same. Um, but instead, what one should do, is, as Rob uh, already suggested, is build a bespoke customized benchmark for every manager that as well as possible replicates the constraints under which that manager operates in order to then measure under those specific constraints how well does the manager uh, do his or her job. And so this is, this is where we then get into, you know, the, the, the issue that Rob already brought up. You know, if, if this is true, if, you know, you want to evaluate managers relative to um, a set of constraints, then you, you start, you have the second dimension of a problem from the investor's perspective that the investor needs to now not only find um, a good manager, but he has to firstly, and, and we show, you know, as a, sec, as a first order effect, has to also find the fund with the appropriate constraints to implement and you know the to the extent that uh, constraints are more binding uh, the you know, there's less room for outperformance um, and, and therefore the, the, the first piece of, of the problem becomes less important and so that's hard and it's a big assumption uh, I think or we think uh, that to assume that investors can actually look through these two layers of choice um, first finding the right institutional infrastructure under which the fund operates. And then secondly, find um, the right management team, um, maybe within that fund family to, uh, to uh, run the fund. And so over time, um, and, and certainly in the last latest version of the paper, we've started shifting focus and discussion a little bit away from this two dimensional investor problem. I rather started to think about, you know, if you were a fund board member, or you were a, a part of a larger fund family, how would you think about various managers' performance, given that, you know, in this case, you've actually put these constraints in place, um, you know, as, as a board or as a fund family, you, you constructed the institutional framework under which the manager operates. And therefore, it is only fair to consider that framework when evaluating whether the manager does a decent job within that uh, set of constraints. Um, Michael, uh, Neil Stodden has had a question. Is this any different than just calculating an alpha with respect to some Vanguard mutual funds that are only long? 
Um, it, it, so yes and no. Certainly, it, it, it would be no different than perhaps calculating the alpha with respect to a second fund that shares all the same institutional constraints as the first one does. Um, so, so that's certainly true. If you could find apples and apples um, and compare them, that would be a valid comparison. But um, to compare a um, one fund that's, let's say, Vanguard fund um, to another fund that has institutionally a limit on how many stocks it can hold. So, for example, in our university of mutual funds that can can that have to hold 25 stocks or less and so uh, you know drawing that comparison between a highly concentrated versus a highly diversified fund is it, simply not an apples to apples comparison and that's where we would argue that the relevant benchmark to compare this concentrated manager to would be something that mimics the same level of concentration risk Um, so what we want to do in the paper, uh, I want to keep an eye on my time here. What we want to do on the paper is the, develop a methodology, propose a methodology to um, build a bespoke comparison portfolio to which to compare the manager to. And the basic idea here is that we're, we're solving a, essentially solving the fund manager's problem under the fund manager's constraint. Um, looking at well ex post, given you know the historical performance of uh, you know various characteristics in the cross section of stocks, um, how well did the manager do relative to how he or she could have done within the set, same set of constraints, um, given the historical data? Um, we're going to do that uh, using or expanding on some work that I had done with Pedro Santa Clara and Ross and Balkanov. Um, really uh, customizing that framework, which is more from an asset, more, more designed for asset allocation, uh, customizing it to sector tilts and within sector stock selection, which is what many of these, most of these funds will actually think of as being the bread and butter activity. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you that, um, that extension in a second. Uh, before I get into that detail, just one quick comment on performance evaluation. So we different ways that people have, have obviously uh, measured performance. Um, you know, here are three, you know, in the context of mean variance efficient frontier, you can certainly look at a fund and compare it to another portfolio or uh, the portfolio of with the highest sharp ratio. Um, that's kind of the, the, the intuition of, of using the market portfolio. Um, you can uh, compare it to an uh, other portfolios with the same level of risk and alternatively compared to other portfolios with the same average return. And uh, we're focusing on the third because what it does is it takes a performance evaluation problem and maps it directly into a mean variance uh, portfolio optimization problem. Um, and so we're going to try to find a benchmark for every manager in our sample that has the same average return as what the manager delivered historically. Um, under the same constraints that the manager is facing, um, but with less risk. And the hope was, um, as you know, probably most papers do in this literature, is to somehow overturn the puzzle and, and some, somehow take the distribution of manager performance, which is currently solidly centered um, on the negative side of zero and shift it so it's closer to, you know, perhaps on average zero. And um, the spoiler alert is that we did not manage to do that. Um, even taking into account constraints um, does not overturn the puzzle or the empirical observation that on average, most of these managers in this sample underperform uh, just simple benchmarks. Um, but what it does do, um, it does illustrate in certain examples that we'll, we'll highlight um, the importance of constraints when you're comparing managers to one another. That a manager that um, in a non-constrained fashion might look sort of like a middle of the road average, um, might once taking constraints and mandates into account, um, look more like a star manager within this cohort group. Uh, and, and that's gonna be sort of the, pun the punchline at the end. Um, so uh, we're going to find a benchmark portfolio and, and all I'm doing here is some re rewriting, you know, kind of that benchmark construction as a mean variance portfolio optimization problem. Find a benchmark portfolio that has the same expected or average return as um, our fund does. And very importantly, imposes the same constraints as um, what the fund manager, um, what he or she faces. 
uh, when solving that problem in the real world. And that uh, leads us to two challenges. One is um, we need to have data on these constraints um, that are being imposed. And secondly, we need to solve a rather difficult mean variance optimization problem. After all, this is you know, what, what um, folks like those managers get ultimately paid for. Um, the first part it turned into a data collection project. Um, and uh, basically what we did is we identified a subset of funds that we are interested in. And these are these uh, capital growth, cap these opportunity funds that lie in the center of kind of the middle of you know, index funds and totally unconstrained funds. Um, and for them collected, hand collected um, a list of what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. What are the, the rules of, of engagement? Um, and then we took, uh, finally uh, took the portfolio optimization um, method that um, we developed earlier for more of an asset allocation framework and uh, changed it a bit up, uh, changed it up a little bit um, in order to solve these constraint benchmark problems. Um, I already mentioned this, um, the funds that we're going to look at are active mutual funds um, that are uh, focused on um, either um, industry rotation or stock selection within an otherwise pretty vanilla you know, US uh, equities um, universe. Um, again, sitting in between index funds, which arguably are much easier to benchmark and absolute return funds for a traditional performance evaluation, just risk adjusted returns probably is the right, right way to think of them because they don't operate under constraints by, by uh, definition. So we started out with 141 um, US domestic capital appreciation funds. Uh, and these are these funds that are um, relatively um, unconstrained in terms of what they can do, except that the universe is well-defined. And so it's easier to, to, to plug these funds into more traditional uh, sort of cross-sectional stock evaluation um, and stock portfolio optimization. Uh, we hand collected from the prospectuses um, various information about what they're allowed to do. And, and specifically what, um, what we collected were, was information about um, what kind of securities um, these, secu these funds were allowed to hold. And I'll, I'll show you a list of uh, more specific data in a second. Um, what the fund is allowed to do in terms of cash investments, leverage, and, and broad investment policy. Um, any other securities the fund is allowed to invest in, you know, fixed income, derivatives, et cetera, um, whether there is a benchmark um, that the fund was supposed to manage toward and, and or whether there is a volatility target or a um, tracking error uh, target uh, for this particular security. So um, after we went through these funds and looked at also to what extent we had historical data, this turned into somewhat of a small data problem, um, unfortunately. So we ended up with about half of our universe only having more than 10 years of historical data. Um, and that therefore is um, the universe of managers we're gonna look at more specifically. So here's the information we collected. Um, here's uh, in the first box is the security specific information. So the number of securities in the portfolio, oftentimes it's unconstrained as I said, some, some, are, some funds are constrained to have a minimum number of securities uh, as a diversification limit. Others, uh, others have restrictions on um, how many Securities are allowed to be invested in because they're more um, they're more concentrated by design. Uh, the type of securities, whether it's growth or value tilts, whether it's a market cap tilt, uh, to what extent they're either industry focused, um, so it might might be a uh, consumer discretionary fund only, um, or on the other extreme, to what extent it's the fund has to mimic the industry composition of some benchmark, uh, such as the market portfolio uh, and the amount of international holdings. Um, then at the investment policy level, um, to what extent funds are allowed to hold cash, borrow, um, and how actively they're allowed to trade um, the um, securities they're trading, uh, the amount of other securities, and, and one of the big ones here, which we've abstracted from, but it is, but it is an important one, and you know, if you, um, you know, ever read the notices your broker sends, one that obviously is important to managers too, is security lending. Um, which we haven't explicitly incorporated, but it is something that's, you know, all these perspectives will list as something that the fund either does or does not do. Benchmarks, and then finally, um, whether or not there's a volatility target um, underlying the mandate. Michael, there was another question from um 
Umang uh, Ketan, he asked whether you think that by customizing benchmarks, we're diluting the purpose of benchmarking itself. Um, yes, I think that, and that goes back to what, what Rob said. It, 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 it introduces a second dimension to the um, choice of an end investor, um, because you know, one of the things that we ended up documenting is that for the, um, for the funds that we looked at, uh, choosing the right constraints is as important as choosing the right manager within its, his or her constraints, if that makes sense. And so um, you know, that's that second dimension of a problem, which you know, at that point, um, it, it definitely does defeat the whole point, the, the whole idea of you know, being able to compare two managers to one another. One manager might be a better manager operating under worse constraints for the ultimate outcome of return generation and therefore would, would reasonably not be as, uh, as wise of a choice for an investor. And so um, that's, that's a discussion I think that you know, we, one would need to have, but we're just trying to make the, the simpler point that um, on the other hand, just ignoring these constraints is also not right because there are funds in our sample at least that did a lot better once constraints have been incorporated into their evaluation, then they look uh, look like uh, unconditionally when these constraints are ignored. Um, really briefly, and and uh, for for the interest of time, just kind of um, skip over much of this. But this is um, just a, a refresher of um, what I had done with Pedro and Rasen on solving similar problems, you know, how to solve large scale portfolio optimization problems, um, where um, in this case, we, I've simplified things. I got rid of the constraints. So it's just um, minimize the variance of a portfolio subject to an expected return target. And uh, the object of uh, portfolio choices, find these time varying um, portfolio weights W, they should have little T's on them. Um, because they're time dependent, and uh, you know the the our approach um, in our paper back then was simply to say, well, those time dependent weights, they're really implicitly functions of uh, one of two sets of variables: either the characteristics of the stock, um, and that could be a firm characteristic or a factor loading, um, or uh, the characteristic of the macro environment. And so, therefore, um, what we propose is simply to parameterize. Um, in a relatively low, low parameter space, um, these optimal portfolio weights as functions of firm characteristics and state variables. And so um, what we proposed uh, specifically is to write the optimal portfolio weight at time T for an investment in firm I as the benchmark weight. Um, so that's kind of the starting point um, from which you would not depart if you didn't really have a reason to. Um, plus, um, deviations from the benchmark weights, which we constructed to be normalized and mean zero in the cross section, so that if you're overweighting a given stock by one dollar um, for whatever reason, a characteristic or a factor exposure, there is a, a matching funding um, uh, underweighting somewhere else in the cross section, so that your portfolio weights at the end of the day still add up to to be um, a two one. Um, we back then uh, normalized the firm characteristics, which are denoted by C here. So think of this as maybe a standardized version of uh, the size of the book to market value of a firm. It just tells you what kind of firm it is um, and, and therefore uh, determines to what extent you want to tilt into or away from that firm relative to the firm's benchmark weight. Uh, we normalize that by the number of firms in the cross section, just with the very simple intuition that if you had a stock split, and now you have two firms with the same characteristics, you wouldn't, you wouldn't logically want a W investment um, in that particular firm characteristic. Um, and, and therefore it had to somehow be, be normalized in the cross section. Uh, we, we do things a little bit differently in this paper. Um, but once you have a parametric form, so you have a parameterization of how portfolio weights depend on characteristics and parameters, um, the parameters are by assumption, state and time independent so the whole problem unconditions, uh, conditions down, and it becomes an optimization in a low dimensional parameter space theta as opposed to high dimensional weight space W, um, which can be solved. Um, so that's what we did in this paper, except um, we needed to 
kind of get a little bit more realistic about what kind of portfolios um, a bespoke benchmark would look like, uh, what that would look like, given that we're trying to evaluate some relatively sophisticated managers um, and specifically managers that uh, pride themselves on being able to do one of two things, either uh, tactically tilt into certain industries and, and industry groups and, and therefore end up with an industry composition that looks different than their benchmark and or um, select individual securities within their target universe uh, and overweight them relative to their benchmark weights. And so here's uh, very briefly how we accomplished um, that change. And then I will jump to the empirical results real quick. So each stock we assign to an industry, a style group and a size group. So think of that as kind of a 10 by two by two um, uh, categorization of firms. For each of those categories, we calculate two sets of characteristics for every firm, the average characteristic of the group and the difference of the characteristic of the firm from the group average. The average characteristic of the group basically just describes you know, that industry's characteristic. This is a growth industry versus a value industry. This is a industry with positive momentum and industry with negative momentum. Um, the second set of characteristics, the deviations from the average describe the firm and how it fits into its overall industry group. So this is a winner relative to the rest of the industry or a loser relative to the rest of the industry, or this is a bigger or larger component of an industry group. We then assign different parameters to um, the average characteristics of the firm versus the difference between the characteristics at the firm's characteristics and the industry averages in order to allow the optimal portfolio to tilt either into different industry groups and therefore achieve kind of that first bit that I talked about, managers wanting to pick the right industry mix um, to be in particularly maybe at different parts of the business cycle. Um, and on the other hand, allow firms to, to pick out individual securities within an industry to security select. The second uh, thing that we changed relative to um, our original paper is allow the tilt to be asymmetric. Um, and uh, we did that by, by adding two more sets of parameters to the optimal portfolio policy um, so that a underweighting of a firm within an industry didn't have to, doesn't have to be offset by an overweighting of a firm within that same industry, um, for example. So these tilts don't have to be symmetric. Um, that allows you to pick a winner, uh, pick a positive characteristic stock in high tech and offset it or fund it with a uh, not so desirable firm in healthcare, for example, uh, which otherwise wouldn't have been possible. Michael, you have about four minutes. Yep. Let me jump to, the, to what we end up finding. Um, we're going to incorporate five constraints. The investment universe, which is a set of stocks, um, the manager is allowed to invest in, large cap versus a whole US universe or maybe in a specific industry. Borrowing and lending constraints, which turn out to be constraints on these beta coefficients that I briefly flashed before you in, in the previous slide. Short sale constraints, which turn out to be parameter restrictions on the alpha coefficients that, elect, that determine the tilts across industries or the tilt across stocks within an industry. We look at constraints on total turnover and incorporated quadratic transaction costs, kind of a proxy of trading penalties um, in, in the problem in order to make it more realistic. And as Rob said, that's sort of one dimension that the mutual fund literature has moved into. And um, you know, this is what the data shows, you know, these sort of hypothetical examples that are, the example I showed you earlier actually looks like. So, you know, different mean variance efficient frontiers under uh, empirically now. Um, under different constraints. So you have a small cap efficient frontier and a large cap efficient frontier. You have a growth frontier and you have a value frontier. And the extent to which a manager is constrained to be in one subset of the universe or the other is going to determine you know, which one ought he or she be compared to. Um, there are you know, obviously constraints that don't allow uh, for much borrowing. Um, there's ones that don't allow for any um, any cash uh, holdings or limited cash holdings. And then finally, short sell constraints, which you know very clearly are very important. Um, so with short selling, with uh, limited short selling or with no short selling. 
And so when you put all that together, here's what a, what a now more realistic example might look like. Um, this is a value line fund um, in our sample, of one of those um, uh, 70 or so growth opportunity funds. Um, this is the unconditional benchmark to which the fund would have traditionally been compared, um, but it's a large cap fund. It has no cash holdings. It has a constraint on turnover, which now gets us to this red frontier here. And finally, it has a, it's trading in a relative expensive uh, set of securities, which gets us to this blue frontier. And you know, as I sort of suggested earlier, we're hoping that we can move this black dot somewhere over here um, and, and conclude that in a larger sample, which we have, um, on average, the funds look like they actually perform up to their benchmark, um, but it turns out they don't. Um, and the degree to which they don't is you know, most intuitively illustrated kind of in, in this picture. So what we have here is a histogram of basically the number of uh, funds in our universe. Um, and what's on this axis is the amount of excess risk the, fund is the funds are taking. Now we normalize by the return of the fund. That's, that's really weird because you potentially could divide by zero, but it turns out all these funds have average, positive average returns. So it gives you a sense of how much more risk do they take to generate one more unit of, of return. Um, and what we start out with is the pink histogram. So you know all of the funds took more risk than they needed to compared to an unconditional benchmark. And on average, they took about two to, two to 3% more risk than they needed to in order to achieve their, their return uh, realization. Once we cap incorporate the bespoke um, constraints, we're basically shifting that distribution closer towards zero, but we're not centering it at zero. Um, so we find you know, there is a subset of funds that actually close to perform as well as they could have given the constraints that they've been, been um, uh, imposed on them. But then there's still a relatively large part of the population, importantly, very, you know, no mass of managers on the other side of zero. Um, to, to conclude that you know, we really reverse the puzzle um, and, 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 uh, and show you know, some, some degree of acceptable performance. Um, one final slide, and, and then, I, uh, then I stop talking. Um, this is a ranking chart. And uh, basically what it takes, it, it does is we have 11 value funds in our universe. Um, and so we, we rank those 11 value funds based on the unconditional um, performance relative to just a standard benchmark. And then we did the same thing and we ranked the same funds um, based on their bespoke benchmarks, now incorporating each fund specific constraint um, in the construction of that, um, that bespoke benchmark. And so what happened here, for example, is that there was a fund um, that unconditionally looked like kind of top third to maybe middle of the middle of the pack. Um, that conditionally, once the constraints have been incorporated into the performance evaluation problem, turned out to be a top performing fund in this universe. And likewise, there was, you know, here's your number three fund um, that looked like a top three manager that once you allow, look at the constraints, which must have been relatively lax, uh, laxer than in the case of you know, with the other one that we just discussed, uh, turned out to be not nearly as good. And, and, and once you impose the constraints, it became more of an average fund. And, and that's kind of the point of the, the ultimate punchline of the paper is to say that taking these constraints into account does matter. And it matters particularly when you're trying to line up managers and rank them. Um, because intuitively, the more you constrain the manager, the less they're able to, to um, they're less likely they are to end up being the top performer unconditionally. And I will stop with that. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, so if you can unshare your screen, I'm going to uh, give it over to our discussant, uh, who is Clemens Sialm from UT Austin. So Clemens, you have 10 minutes. And while Clem is getting started, let me just remind you again, you could ask questions in the chat and we'll get to them in the Q&A if, if time permits. Okay. Great. I thank very much the organizers for asking me to discuss this paper. It's a fun paper and it's on an important uh, topic. Mutual fund managers face significant investment constraints, which should reduce their performance. And this paper proposes a new benchmark that incorporates the impact of those constraints. And I have five main comments on the discussion. Uh, the first comment is on the 
objective uh, function. Uh, the authors use expected utility maximization uh, where they, uh, the, they maximize over the return of a fund, which is a collection of different individual securities. And to make this, mod, uh, this optimization tractable and more stable, they use the linear parameterization from an influential paper by Michael Pedro and Drossen. And there, the weights, they have to be a function of the characteristics. Like first, there's the benchmark weight. And then you have as well the active weight, which depends on the characteristics of the stocks. And the characteristics that they use is size, book to market, and momentum. And the utility function is uh, constant relative risk aversion. And then in a third step, they include various portfolio constraints for investment style, cash, short sales, turnover, and transactions costs. And this is really useful to, to understand how important or how binding are those constraints. And this linear parameterization is actually very powerful because it reduces the dimensionality. And many asset managers use similar approaches to, to, to form their portfolios. And here's the example from value line that Michael as well showed. We see here the fund, it has a return of about 9% over this time period and the standard deviation of 20%. And if we compare it to an unconstrained benchmark, which is shown here in red, we would argue that the fund is uh, underperforming dramatically. Alternatively, you could as well look at the return difference here and and that might even appear to be bigger and now we see how those different constraints affect the um, the performance the first constraint is here to focus on the universe of large cap stocks of course that doesn't allow you such a high diversification and then the second big change is actually once you impose uh, no borrowing on, on no lending constraint, and then you have here a curve, a portfolio frontier. And the other constraints in this example, the turnover constraint, sector neutrality and transactions costs are relatively minor. And therefore, most of the difference is actually driven by those two first constraint, the investment universe and the cash. But still, even in this case, the fund would still uh, underperform. It has a higher standard deviation than those portfolios. And here is an, another example uh, where the second constraint, the cash constraint, is relatively more important. Now, my main comment about the objective function is that, that a typical mutual fund investor is fairly well diversified. According to the ICI, a me, the median mutual fund investor owns five different mutual funds. One of them might be a Vanguard index fund and others might be more specialized funds. And a second part is as well that the mutual fund investor can adjust portfolio leverage by buying or by doing homemade leverage with treasury securities, bank accounts, or maybe even taking advantage of secured loans like mortgages. And therefore some of this uh, improvement can be done by the investors as well. And therefore the utility of an investment depends not just on the performance of one individual fund, it depends on the complete portfolio of all the different assets held by the fund that that makes as well the total risk of the portfolio potentially less relevant than its contribution to the risk. What we would want is actually how much does that fund contribute to the overall uh, portfolio. And in the industry, people often use the information ratio which compares benchmark adjusted returns with uh, the tracking error and potentially the authors could look more at constraints or alternative measures like this. I think they could adjust their, their, uh, their problem to, to using alternative measures. Now, a second point is that the index benchmark that is most frequently used in practice actually is already very highly constrained. It's a fixed investment universe. There's no cash holdings, typically no leverage. 
Typically, there's no short selling and the turnover is minimal. And therefore, what is currently done in practice is to compare the fund with one of those index benchmarks. Obviously, as people have shown, there as well some issues with manipulation of the benchmark, with selective choice of benchmarks. And therefore, that's not a perfect uh, solution either. But the most commonly used benchmarks are highly constrained. And here in, in this graph that we looked at before, I show as well the, I added the S&P 500 fund or the S&P index without fees. And that had a return of almost 12% and the standard deviation of about 16%. And therefore as well outperformed the fund uh, quite a bit. But it is interesting that this highly constrained portfolio is aligning pretty well with the green uh, or somewhere between the green and the, the uh, red or purple curve here. Now, um, in academia, people have used factor-based performance measures, or I, th I see the paper actually closes to holdings-based performance measure. For example, Danny and Grim Grimblad, Titman and Wormers match the stocks held by a fund with similar stocks and compare the performance. Or Hoberg, Kumar, and Prabala in a recent paper, they as well find customized benchmark for each individual fund by looking at the other funds that hold similar styles. But again, those papers don't look as, or they don't look at other constraints like short selling constraints. And, and that is a, a very nice contribution of the current paper. The third comment I have is what I call out of sample performance. The characteristics used in the portfolio optimization are market cap, book to market and momentum. And optimizing over these characteristics results in very high maximum sharp ratios. Like the in sample one is 1 1.2 and the out of sample is one. And the reason for that is that size book to market and momentum uh, way important factors over this time period, but the out of sample results are not truly out of sample since they rely on those characteristics that have been shown to do well over this time period. And for example, value over the last 10 years hasn't done as well. And therefore, maybe the benchmarks, especially the unconstrained benchmarks might actually be uh, very hard to achieve because some of those characteristics are picked ex exposed. Um, my fourth comment is on economic significance. Um, I really like the comparison where funds are compared using before and after adjusting for constraints. And this is the same graph that Michael showed as well. And we see some difference here, for example, for value, it's uh, uh, the two measures are not as highly correlated, but for example, for large cap funds, it's pretty high. And if we compute the rank correlations, that's actually 98%, but for value, it's 75 or 0 0.75, the, the correlation. And to, to see whether this is high or low, I, computed CAPM alphas and Fama French alphas, just to, to get a comparison with what would you get uh, using different measures and but something that we understand relatively well, like if we add the two factors and here it's all done within the style groups, like large growth, large value. And the rank correlations are actually lower, especially once we focus on large cap stocks um, when we would compare the rank of CAPM and Fama French alphas. And the sample here is constructed in a similar way um, as what Michael did in their paper, although I have a, a bigger sample since I don't need the, the constraints. But that shows that um, there is definitely some impact, especially among small capitalization and value funds, but it's not as large as going from the CAPM to the Fama French alphas. And the last point is was brought up by Rob and as well in the presentation, 
constraints and mandates are selected by fund advisors, boards, for several reasons. It's an endogenous choice. Investors care about those constraints. And reasons to impose constraints might be to monitor your managers for risk management. It could be family diversification strategies. Like a family might want a small value fund, even if they don't think small value is really a promising area. And they might as well have, on the other hand, a large growth fund. And they want to separate those funds for family diversification strategies. Uh, constraints might as well, for example, be for taxes. If your investors are taxable, uh, then you might want to avoid realizing short-term capital gains and you want, might want to encourage the loss, tax loss harvesting. And that wouldn't be directly reflected in, in performance, but it would benefit your investors. And finally, constraints might as well attract flows. Like some of your investors might not want to buy mutual funds that uh, buy derivatives because they think derivatives are very risky, like Warren Buffett said, weapons of mass destruction. And, and therefore you can actually increase flows by constraining yourself. And now the question is whether you should incorporate these constraints when evaluating a fund's performance and it might matter who you look at. If you look at the investor, or if you look at the fund family that tries to compensate its managers, I think it makes more sense when you think about a fund family that wants to decide whether a manager added value to the portfolio, then you want to uh, take into account the constraints. But if you look at the broad fund investor, you want as well to see what the impact of the constraints themselves are, whether those make sense or not. I have a couple of additional uh, smaller comments that I can discuss with the authors, but overall it's a fascinating paper. It led me to think about a lot of important questions and uh, it shows as well that those constraints have a big impact on the portfolios. Thank you so much, Clemens. Um... So we're learning, running slightly late. So I'm just going to go straight to some questions from the chat here. Um, we're going to try to have the question and askers to ask them live in person. So I'm going to start out uh, with uh, Joan Gomez from IE Business School. Joan, are you with us? Hi. Hey. Hello. Do you hear me? Hear you well. OK, fine. So very quickly. Uh, is related to, to Clement's point, um, the idea that the benchmark is actually part of the solution. It should be the outcome of a problem where the, the constraints uh, you know, are already set. So it's endogenous. So it was, I mean, I know it's besides the point of the paper, but uh, have you thought about what is the underlying problem? So say that the fund wants to actually find, build this uh, bespoke benchmark. So what is the problem that you, you have in mind? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I. I don't have an answer. Um, I, I, it's a really well taken point. They're absolutely endogenous. Um, I actually think you know, the alignment of end investor utility with fund manager actions has you know, clearly something to do with it as well. And those are not two separate problems uh, because one way that you can obviously incentivize the manager to do what you want them to do is constrain them to not do something you know, mm -hmm. far away from the optimum. Um, so those are all Great. I, I just don't know how to formulate the initial point. And, and you know, as, as Rob suggested in the ESG case, which is, you know, mm -hmm. probably a better, better laboratory to study this in. You know, it's fascinating just the different definitions of what ESG means. You know, the, the man of the investor's first job is to find the right ESG definition provider um, before even thinking about what manager to hire, because that's going to be first order for what kind of securities end up in the portfolio. Thank you. Um, I want to just really quickly while, while we switch to somebody else, but you know that point about the ex post picking of the characteristics is um, absolutely well taken. Um, you know that I think applies to pretty much any uh, paper that uses you know these features for any sort of ex post evaluation, but it, it's important to keep in mind. Great. Um, okay, so let's go to the next question by Alan Zhang. Alan. 
Hello, Hello. Hello. Hey, we can oh, hear you. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, the, the main question I had was just, um, was the data around the fund constraints uh, the main limiting factor in conducting this study more broadly? Yeah, it, it was the, it, it was the binding constraint for, you know, in, in one direction, um, you know, Clem's point about the market being the appropriate, already very constrained um, benchmark is, is absolutely valid. If you have an index fund that only has a, you know, 10, 25, 50 basis point tracking error relative to its benchmark, you know, the, the benchmarking problem has already been taken care of. And, and on the other hand, um, you know, if you look at for prospectuses of very largely un, uh, unconstrained funds, you know, you're kind of missing the point because there's no constraint to incorporate. So it, it, it was a fairly subtle search to try to identify a set of mat, a set of mutual funds for, with it, for which this is actually a, a really important problem um, and not to let the empirical work thing get contaminated by funds for which it clearly isn't an issue. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. Uh, great. Let's take uh, one last question. Um, next question is from uh, Valeria Fedek. Uh, Valeria? Um, yes. I was wondering, did you consider taking into account also the timing of flows as a kind of ongoing additional constraint that could obfuscate the fund rankings? For instance, if a fund suffered a very large redemption with significant trading impact, even though the manager was skilled and the performance might not be as good as expected? Yeah, we did not. Um, so the, the work we did is, is all averages, historical averages. So it would average out any big flows that um, might have impacted performance. Um, also, you know, when we look at things like cash holdings, you know, these are average cash holdings, not um, around big flows or anticipated flows. Mm -hmm. uh, great. Okay, so we are uh, closing in on the second uh, session here, but uh, we have a minute left. So, Michael, do you want to comment on Clement's uh, discussion? The, they were all great, great comments. Thank you very much. I, I think yeah, they're all well taken and. Um, you know, I, I think the, the biggest issue to me still is the endogeneity of the constraints. Um, and, and, you know, really the point that, that's being highlighted, I think, is that investors are buying constraints probably more so than they're, act, than they're buying manager skill. Um, and so understanding that, that problem, I, I think, is it's ultimately going to be important. All right. Thank you so much. So thank you to uh, Michael and thank you to Clemens for a great discussion. Um, and we're, I think uh, we're basically on time for session two here. So we'll move to our next presenter. Let's see. There you go. All right. So next up, we have uh, Leonid Kogan is going to present common fund flows, flow hedging and factor pricing. And this will be discussed by Sidney Ludvigson. So uh, Leonid, just take it away when you're ready. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting us to present this paper. This is a bit of a Wharton reunion. Uh, so uh, this paper is uh, joined uh, with uh, Winston Doe uh, from uh, Wharton and uh, Weibo from Texas A&M, Common Fund Flows for Hedging and Factor Pricing. And um, uh, to motivate uh, this project, uh, we can start thinking about uh, the, the traditional dynamic asset pricing models and what assumptions go into them so a lot of models uh, follow the general framework of uh, ICAPM, and they essentially neoclassic constitution free models and the households are marginal investors. And uh, the problem with this framework, the limitation is that it does place a significant uh, burden on households in terms of information processing and uh, being able to form expectations about the dynamics and also build these uh, dynamic optimal plans. Uh, so that's also a source of skepticism that uh, I guess many in the profession have about the conclusions of these models that really assume households to be uh, super powerful in terms of being rational and being able to compute things. Uh, that is the limitation. And um, in reality, of course, uh, households uh, may not be the marginal prices in different markets. Uh, they may not engage uh, so much in security selection. Uh, there are institutions that are playing an important uh, role in the markets and they exclude it from these models. And the institutions, uh, of course, we can model them, but they have different objectives from households. And so what uh, our focus here is uh, on understanding how this difference in objectives may play out in terms of pricing implications and to what extent we can retain 
uh, some of the pricing results that we like about macroeconomic shocks being priced in the cross-section of returns uh, in an environment where households don't need to be super sophisticated and may behave in a relatively simplistic manner and it falls on institutions uh, to act as marginal pricers and uh, to create pricing relations between risk and return in the market. So that's kind of a general theoretical motivation maybe, but what we actually do is um, we focus um, on the behavior of uh, active uh, mutual fund managers. And uh, as uh, Rob already summarized in the, his overview, we make the first observation is that uh, fund managers, to the extent that they care about their AUM, that because their fees are related to their AUM, uh, AUM is driven by returns that uh, their portfolio generates, but also by flows in and out of the fund. And uh, these flows can be substantial and uh, they can affect uh, AUM quantitatively as much as returns. So if you look at the uh, variance of uh, changes in AUM and you think about how much uh, is um, coming from returns and how much is coming from uh, flows, uh, flows are a substantial piece. So they're economically meaningful. So our goal here is to understand both theoretically and empirically uh, hedging behavior of uh, fund managers. Do they care about these flows? Can we see a reveal preference that they are tilting their portfolios to control flow risk? And uh, we want to uh, show the implications of this kind of flow hedging behavior for asset pricing. And uh, in particular, we want to see to what extent an icapm like relation emerges where non-market aggregate shocks may be priced in an environment that uh, is essentially myopic, where there is no intertemporal hedging. Uh, as Rob mentioned, is this an efficient way to deal with flow risk? No, it wouldn't be, uh, but uh, we're not trying to figure out efficient contracts. This does look um, like an agency problem and uh, it seems to be costly to investors because managers are not doing exactly what investors would want, just like firm managers are not doing exactly what uh, shareholders would want. But we take this agency problem as given. We're not trying to figure out an efficient contract. That is basically a different line of inquiry, which also seems like it would be interesting to pursue. So what we find is the following. Empirical, we find that uh, fund flow shocks have a strong factor structure that is an important common component. And this common component uh, comes with some macroeconomic states. So for example, it comes with the economic uncertainty, aggregate uncertainty. So it connects macroeconomic shocks uh, with fund flows and ultimately with asset prices. Uh, we find that the flow beta is uh, priced in the cross-section of stock returns. Uh, uh, what that means is that stocks with the high flow beta have relatively high expected returns. And uh, this uh, appears to be a compensated risk factor, which is analogous to the ICAPM intertemporal hedging term without actual intertemporal hedging in the model. So in the data, we see that these slow betas do predict returns in the cross section of stocks, and we control for some characteristics to see to what extent. This is a separate phenomenon from what we already know. Uh, what's important here is that uh, we don't just look at the implications for returns, but we also look directly at the holdings of managers uh, so that we can get a better feel for whether or not the mechanism is actually there in the data. So we look at the portfolio uh, holdings of the managers, we look at the tilts in their portfolios relative to market weights. And what we see is that uh, in the aggregate, uh, these active fund managers, they tend to tilt away from high flow beta stocks. This tilt is costing them and their investors uh, expected returns. So they are uh, underperforming relative to what they could have done if they didn't tilt. And uh, we find that the magnitude of the tilt uh, changes with the amount of outflow risk. So when uh, managers are facing more of this flow risk, aggregate flow risk, they're tilting more. And uh, we are finding these results, uh, not just in the cross section of funds, but also we look at uh, time variation in the tilt and some quasi natural experiments. So we could sort of control for the fund characteristics and look at uh, a cleaner kind of time variation in the incentive to tilt and the portfolio tilt itself. So many people worked on the related literature. There is no way I can discuss that here. Let me introduce the model and some empirical results. The model is an equilibrium model with a relatively simple structure. Some of the elements of the model are essential for the results. Some are there because we need to complete the model. 
to get to the equilibrium. And uh, those secondary elements could be rewritten in many different ways, preserving the main conclusions. So what are the main elements of the model? We assume that everyone in this environment is myopic. This is not because we believe that everyone in the market is myopic, but uh, pedagogical, this is kind of nice to make the point that this is not about intertemporal hedging. In particular, we have three types of uh, actors here. We have uh, direct investors who measure their own portfolios. We have fund clients. These are investors who, in equilibrium, delegate their portfolios to the active fund managers. And then we have fund managers themselves who care only about their AUM and don't care about welfare of their investors. So they behave as a, a good economic agent, sure, completely selfish. So now, what we find uh, in the model is that uh, there is endogenous fund flow that responds, responds to aggregate shocks. And we also find that these funds have endogenous alphas in equilibrium. These are secondary results. They're not uh, critical for getting the main conclusion about hedging, but they actually go against the main results. So it's kind of interesting to see that we can get these uh, patterns that are empirically realistic and that they preserve the main results. So basically, we find that uh, fund alphas, net alphas are countercyclical, and the fund flows are procyclical. And uh, as I said before, this uh, link is really central, the link between macro shocks and asset prices that goes through the fund flows. Basically, funds don't care about their investors directly, only through the flows. So they wouldn't care about macro shocks that affect their investors but they do respond to the fund flows. And this is why macroeconomic shocks that may be important for households in terms of inducing them to move their money in and out of the mutual fund sector, these shocks will eventually make their way into risk premium and into asset prices. All right, now let me describe some of the structure of the model. If you don't follow these equations, which I don't expect you to do in real time, it's fine, uh, basically, uh, Qualitatively, in terms of the moving pieces, it's a fairly simple setting. So basically, we have an endowment economy, uh, a large number of uh, risky assets, and a finite small number of common factors. So it's kind of like an APT factor structure. And what's highlighted here is this uh, vector U. These are aggregate shocks that are common to all of these securities in the market. And uh, in particular, there is uh, one state variable here. Uh, H, uh, H uh, drives the volatility of these uh, cash flow shocks. Um, for the sake of the argument, this is enough for us to have a single state variable. Of course, that's not supposed to be a realistic description. Uh, in the data, you would expect to see multiple aggregate shocks that matter. But here, it's all about this uncertainty shock, U, that uh, changes volatility of all the dividends uh, at the same time. Now, what uh, this implies is that uh, in equilibrium, uh, stock returns uh, are going to load up uh, on the same common shocks, not surprisingly, on the common shocks here. And uh, the state variable that drives uh, aggregate uncertainty shows up also in the cross section of returns as the common component of uh, return risk. Now, uh, agents in our model, as I said, are myopic, and the way we model them is through an old G structure where each agent lives for one period and uh, they don't care about their descendants. So they're myopic in their behavior. And on top of that, we make some additional assumptions to make sure that wealth gets redistributed uh, after each period. So we don't need to keep track of the time varying persistent uh, uh, dynamics of wealth, which would be kind of irrelevant for the conclusions, but would add state variables. So each uh, generation is uh, born at time T. Uh, has uh, three different types. They have fund managers, fund clients, and direct investors. And managers have no wealth. They just uh, manage funds and they uh, consume their fees. And uh, fund clients and investors, they split the wealth in the economy. So fund clients have fraction lambda and um, they uh, choose how much to delegate to the funds. In equilibrium, they delegate everything in terms of risky assets to the funds. And direct investors, they're born with one minus lambda. They don't delegate anything. They manage their own portfolios. So these direct investors uh, optimize a one period objective. We log linearize everything for tractability. What uh, that implies is that uh, everyone is basically mean variance optimized as the all myopic. Uh, they don't care about high order moments because of this approximation. Uh, direct investors maximize their mean variance objective. Uh, they have a unit elasticity of substitution, so consumption policy is very simple. Uh, 
And uh, one thing to assume is that uh, these direct investors, they um, uh, lose something, uh, they lose this kind of alpha that is collected by the active managers. We don't model exactly how alpha is generated. It's a reduced form assumption that active managers are able to extract some value relative to households to manage their portfolio directly. So in equilibrium, what's important here is that the mean variance optimizers, and they're going to have uh, efficient portfolios. They're going to hold mean variance efficient portfolios. So these are direct investors. Mutual funds. Uh, mutual funds, uh, as I said, they maximize um, utility of the fees they collect, which are proportional to the AUM. They control uh, amount of funds Q in equilibrium. That's the total value of the funds. Uh, it's endogenous. Uh, they uh, are adding some value, which we model in reduced form as being proportional to Q. This is the gross alpha, and uh, they incur some fees, some costs rather, of managing uh, their funds, of generating this alpha, and we model these costs as is common, uh, as a convex function of the size uh, of um, uh, of their capital, and uh, we could do it at the fund level or at the whole industry level. Um, all the funds in the model are the same, so it doesn't matter. And um, they charge a constant fee to the investors, which again is a reduced form assumption, it's not an optimal contract, which is proportional to AUM. So the net result is a pretty standard construction for this literature that net alpha is uh, decreasing in the overall size of the uh, active mutual fund sector. So the smaller the fund sector, the larger the alpha they can generate. So in equilibrium, both the alpha and the amount of delegated funds are determined. So here's the delegation decision. These uh, fund clients are myopic. Uh, they don't even need to have rational expectations about what funds do. That's not important. And we don't even assume that. They essentially, they, focus, they do focus on the alpha. So they uh, do decide how much to delegate uh, a part in relation to the alpha. But to really simplify this, we assume that they just derive utility from delegation. They just like delegating so that in equilibrium, we don't need to solve for what fraction of their wealth they delegate. They delegate everything. They uh, allocate between the risk-free asset and the risky assets on their own, but the risky portfolio, they delegate the whole thing. You could justify it by appealing to some kind of money doctor's idea, but that's really why that assumption is there to simplify the derivation. What is really critical is that the amount that these guys delegate uh, is, um, the amount of the delegate is declining uh, in the aggregate uncertainty of the economy. So that's important. And it also is increasing in the alpha. And so in equilibrium, the amount delegated and the net alpha determined. Currently, and what we find is that net alpha is counter-cyclical and the amount of funds delegated is pro-cyclical. And then when we look at the flows, in particular, we are going to care eventually about the flow shock, the unexpected component of fund flows into the mutual fund sector. Uh, that component uh, loads up on the aggregate uncertainty shocks um, negatively. So when uncertainty rises, money flows out of the mutual fund sector. So that is going to connect uncertainty shocks to pricing in the markets here. All right, as I already said, mutual fund managers consume their fees. They also live for one period. They derive fees from both periods. And um, because of that, they're going to solve a mean, mean variance problem where the objective is not over returns, but rather over the change in AUM, which has a flow piece. And that means that fund managers do not hold uh, a mean variance efficient portfolio. They're going to deviate. They're going to tilt in order to hedge to some degree the flow risk. And in equilibrium, that implies that if you look at the portfolio weight of the fund managers, which is little m, uh, they deviate from the mean variance efficient portfolio in the direction of this tilt, the tilt is related to the betas of individual stocks on the flows. And um, we can uh, show that in equilibrium, if you look at the cross-sectional covariance between the portfolio tilt of the managers relative to the market, right, the deviation of their weight in the security from the market weight and the flow bait of the security, that covariance is negative. So these managers, they downweigh high beta stocks, overweigh low beta stocks, with the, with, where the betas are betas on aggregate flows. Of course, not surprisingly, we end up with a two-factor pricing model. We only have basically two aggregate shocks here. So there is market is going to be inefficient here in a mean variance sense. Uh, it's going to deviate from the tangent portfolio. 
and uh, the deviation is in the direction of this flow beta tilt. So in equilibrium, risk premium on all the stocks are going to be based on a two-factor structure. There is a market exposure that's priced, that's the first term, and there is going to be covariance with the flows that is priced, and that's the second term. All right, so now let me talk about empirical results. The data we use is standard, basically a standard collection of data on mutual fund holdings uh, from Thompson and Crisp and also uh, or their assets under management um, and fund characteristics from Crisp and Morningstar. And we are only looking at the US active mutual funds. We don't look at international funds. We don't look at passive funds. Although passive funds are kind of interesting because flows into passive funds don't have the same properties and they are not priced the same way as flows into active funds are, which is indirectly consistent uh, with our model. But it's basically a non-result, which you would hope to get. We also have data that we need for some quasi-nature experiments. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the um, trade war, but uh, for the natural disasters, we look at the data on natural disasters, the geographic distribution of disasters. So we could um, connect disaster data with the firms. All right. So for the common fund flow, Uh, for the common fund flow, we look at the fund flow first at the fund level, and uh, we extract a common component, theta. Uh, we have some controls for the fund performance to absorb some of the variation of flows that is predictable by past and current performance of the fund itself relative to the market. And this theta represents the common component which we're after. Epsilon is fund-specific uh, unpredictable part. So now we define the common uh, we define the fund flow shock as this common component plus epsilon. And then we aggregate funds into different groups based on characteristics like size and age. And what we observe is that flows that these different groups experience, they are different, but they have a lot in common with each other. So there is clearly, if you look at it just eyeballing it, there is a common component there, a common factor. Uh, that drives uh, flows into different groups of funds, non-developing groups. And uh, you could uh, sort funds on a variety of characteristics. You get kind of similar results. It's sort of like if you sort stocks on size, you could get common component coming from the market. And uh, what we then do is extract uh, uh, principal components uh, from this cross-section of funds, from these buckets of funds. And what you see from these graphs is that the first principal component does explain a lot of uh, variation in the flows. So we take this uh, leading PC as our definition of the systematic or common component of flows. All right, so this definition is robust to some of these other choices that one would make in terms of how you define the universe of fund. Chris, Monistar, intersection or Chris alone. Uh, do you do it by asset size, do you do it by age? So I'm not gonna talk much about using CRISP versus the intersection, the all results are pretty similar in the sense that they go through. All right, so now here's the baseline result that a flow risk is priced. So if you sort stocks on their fund flow beta or you run a cross-sectional regression, you see that there is a correlation between betas and uh, risk premium on the stocks. And these are significant. And uh, CAPM doesn't absorb this. So if you control for the market exposure, it doesn't, uh, absorb that, you have CAPM alphas, and that there is a significant difference between funds with high versus low exposures to the aggregate flows. Uh, this uh, graph just shows you visually what the table is saying. This is a post-formation returns, and you could see that once you allocate stocks into different portfolios, their returns are different for at least the next year in terms of expected returns. So we are sorting here on a very simple definition of the fund flow beta. It's a uh, no parametric estimate based on monthly returns of a three year backward looking window. And uh, in this table, we see post formation betas just to confirm that when we sort on the past betas, we're actually predicting differences in future betas, which we are. So these uh, portfolios are forming that do have different fund flows betas and they have different expected returns. So that's a baseline result by itself. It could mean many different things. But it does say that uh, betas on the fund flows are correlated with the uh, future returns. We also want to confirm that funds actually behave in terms of their portfolio formation, the way that the model predicts. Now, this is a form of a regression. Instead of sorting into portfolios, we just run a cross-sectional regression. 
Uh, this way we could also control for other characteristics. When I say control, this is not because we need to somehow distinguish uh, weight and falls from some stock characteristics. Our theory doesn't say anything about how characteristics are related to the betas. This is just a way of summarizing the data to learn more about the properties. Like for example, um, is this pattern different from just sorting in book to market or sorting on size or liquidity? And so the answer is yes, it is distinct from sorting stocks on these common characteristics. Not that the theory tells us it should be distinct. It could have been exactly the same and maybe this is an explanation for some of these characteristics predicting the chance, but it's not. It's to some degree an explanation, but it's not the same thing. All right, so we have that. Now let's look at the uh, fund behavior. So one thing that we do is we look at the deviation of the fund holdings. This is across the entire universe of active funds, deviations of the holdings of different assets from the market weights. And what we find in this table is that if you run a cross-sectional regression, um, well, this is actually a panel, but uh, think of it as a cross-sectional regression of um, fund um, holdings uh, of different assets, how they deviate from the market on the flow beta of the stock and the market beta. What uh, we care about is the flow beta. You see that they actually um, uh, underway high beta stocks, which is uh, good because that's what the theory is telling us they should be doing in the aggregate. Now, of course, it's possible that there are some unobservable from characteristics that simultaneously predict returns and predict these uh, beta. So that, that could be, but um, notice that they're not chasing returns. They are underweighting stocks that have relatively high risk premium, right? So they are underweighting high beta stocks. So if they were just going for the expected returns, they would be doing the opposite. So th this is hurting their performance. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, flow betas are related to some common from characteristics. Uh, in particular, if you look at uh, things like book to market, liquidity measures, size, they're related to all these things. Uh, and uh, in particular, what you find is uh, basically uh, it's value stocks that have higher flow betas. Uh, it's um, stocks with high liquidity risk and illiquid stocks that have high flow betas. Now liquidity in particular is uh, kind of interesting to think about because uh, I'm kind of going with uh, Rob's narrative here, which we thought about this one. This is kind of problematic potentially that if a stock is illiquid, it's possible that its price gets pushed around more by the aggregate flows. It's conceivable. It's not in the model, but it's quite believable. So an illiquid stock may have high flow beta. In the data, that's actually true. It may also have high expected returns on paper, at least, because it's illiquid. And then it's going to have basically this thing that it's illiquidity that uh, is predicting returns. And it just happens to be correlated with the flow beta. So something like illiquidity is important to control for, which we do. And it doesn't absorb the explanatory power of the flow betas but it does predict returns uh, directly on its own. All right. Uh, the other thing that uh, we did was uh, we looked at the portfolio tilts of um, uh, these uh, mutual funds in relation to firm characteristics. And this is a bit of a sideline. It's related to an interesting point that Sydney and co-authors made that these mutual funds don't seem to be exploiting book to market, for example, the standard quant tilts, they could have done it, but they don't seem to be doing it. They're tilting the other way, if anything. What does that mean, right? So why are they avoiding the tilt? Could be for a variety of reasons. But um, what we found is actually, if you control for the predicted flow beta, which is correlated with book to market, this kind of opposite tilt towards growth, it does disappear in the aggregate. And if you look at the fund level, it actually flips signs. So if you just look at the tilt at the fund level, it's an average against value stocks. But if you control for the flow betas, for the predicted betas, it uh, goes uh, uh, in, in the direction of value stocks away from growth. So it's kind of interesting that um, understanding how funds tilt on flow beta can help in other dimensions, kind of some related questions about their portfolio structure. Now, let me tell you about these quasi niche experiments. Um, so, here, uh, we look at a particular experiment, which is natural disasters. And uh, what we find is that funds that are affected by natural disasters, meaning that a significant fraction of their portfolio 
uh, happens to have this property that firms are headquartered or have lots of establishments in the areas hit by disasters, these funds uh, are facing higher outflow risk going forward. So that is a starting point. So that kind of tells you that natural disasters, which are arguably exogenous to the fund, uh, they do shift uh, their exposure to outflow risk. So that's good. And uh, that uh, partly helps us address this kind of indigeneity issue that uh, yes, outflow risk uh, and uh, uh, tilts are related, but maybe there is a common factor that drives both and we really don't know what it is. So it's a vague kind of uh, argument, but uh, there's always that kind of concern. So in this setting, at least the disasters are exogenous and uh, are not uh, affected by the fund's own behavior. So there is no reverse causality. So we create this uh, disaster variable, which uh, tells us what uh, fraction of the fund value is uh, affected by the disasters based on the headquarter allocations of the companies in the portfolio. And uh, these are idiosyncratic and the exogenous. Um, and uh, we focus on the fund's response in terms of the portfolio composition on the portion of the portfolio not affected by the natural disasters. And um, what we see is that uh, uh, funds that are affected by natural disasters, they do face higher outflow risk in the subsequent periods, which uh, is uh, kind of in line with this design that a natural disaster shock hits the fund and changes its uh, exposure to outflow risk. So this uh, following table basically confirms that funds affected by natural disasters experience not only higher expected outflow, but also higher risk of outflows measured in a variety of ways by dispersion of flows, by the, uh, how heavy the left tail is. So these funds are facing more risk. And then we look for the rebalancing of the stocks that are not directly affected by disasters. The reason why we're looking at the not affected stocks is that we obviously don't want to be in a situation where firm fundamentals are affected by the disaster shock and that's why they're rebalancing. We want to have a somewhat credible story that they're rebalancing because of what the risk that the fund is facing, not because of the properties of the stock itself. And so what we found is that funds do rebalance the unaffected portion of their portfolio. They do rebalance away from the high beta stocks. And uh, this is the interaction term with the natural disasters that when the disaster hits, they change their portfolio composition. And uh, you could have a fund fixed effect. So then we have an average tilt. This is the increase in the tilt following the increased risk of outflows. And uh, we find that this uh, increased tilt is costly to them in a sense that if the, uh, they didn't do it, the way we model it is we basically freeze their portfolio composition uh, before uh, they uh, rebalance their portfolio. And we say, what would have happened if they didn't rebalance? Uh, we find that that uh, reduces their performance. On average, fund rebalancing is actually good uh, for the performance. But this kind of rebalancing they do in response to natural disaster shocks lowers their returns anywhere from 60 to 100 basis points annualized. So that tells us that at least uh, there is no simple explanation that uh, they found a way to chase returns. So that's what we're getting. They're moving against uh, their performance in expectation. They're tilting away from the flow risk at a cost in terms of performance. All right. To conclude, uh, what we found is uh, on the empirical side that uh, there is a common component of fund flows. It is priced in the cross-section of stocks and mutual funds appear to be hedging exposure to the flow risk. On the theoretical side, we show that uh, this kind of behavior by the funds implies that some aggregate shocks that drive flows end up being priced in the cross-section of returns in a way that is similar to the ICAPM pricing relation without the I term. This is a myopic environment where nobody is trying to hedge intertemporally. Uh, there is a simple hedging of the mutual funds intratemporally against fund flows, which significantly reduces the burden on households in terms of decision-making in these models and creates uh, what we think is an interesting link between basically the macro shocks that affect myopic households and institutional decision-making and ultimately asset prices. That's Great. It. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lenny. That was a great presentation and right on time. So um, this piece, uh, please keep uh, posting in the chat too. We will get to the chat uh, questions and comments after the discussion. So uh, please keep doing that. Now we're ready for our discussant, however, and that's uh, Sydney Ludwigson from uh, NYU. So Sydney, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, we can hear you well. Great. Um, hi, everyone. I really enjoyed uh, reading this paper. It took me out of my uh, range of things that I've been thinking about lately. It's an interesting read. So I think this paper makes um, several contributions on the empirical side. It shows that mutual fund flows obey a factor structure and are priced in the cross section of individual stock returns. That's a cool result. Fund flows respond to macro shocks, cool again. Portfolios of active mutual funds are tilted towards low fund betas. You know, that's interesting and makes a lot of sense given their fee structure. Um, and then on the theoretical side, they show that there's one way that you can get all this in general equilibrium. Um, I think that's a feat in and of itself. And then they get an endogenous pro-cyclical flow, uh, mutual fund flow and counter-cyclical net alpha, um, which in turn are driven in their model by exogenous macro shocks. So bottom line, I think these results uh, should be of interest to the profession and they're worth exploring further. So I'm gonna make comments first on the empirical part and questions, and then on the theory, just a couple on the theoretical part. So on the empirical part, the outline is, at first I wanna ask more about the primitive economic shocks that drive these common fund flows. Um, second, I had some questions about the flow betas versus the betas for economic fundamentals and the pricing of stock returns. Third, I uh, just had a question about equity characteristic anomaly portfolio returns and, and their relation possibly to these common fund flows. Okay, so first on the primitive shocks. Um, I, I just think it's a very interesting question, especially given how important mutual funds, you know, and, and pension funds, as the authors mentioned at the beginning of their paper are as asset owners in the equity space to understand what's really driving these flows. And, you know, the authors point out that there are some uncertainty shocks or proxies for uncertainty that are correlated with these flows. And that's certainly interesting. And I, I completely buy that these may be driving some of the flows. But I also look at those correlations and think, well, they're low enough that other shocks uh, must be playing a role. And so one question is, I think, for future research is just to think more about like which shocks are really driving around, what types of shocks are really moving around these fun flows. You know, you can imagine that something, let's just call it beliefs or sentiment, intangible information, something that moves around the willingness to tolerate risk um, independently of sort of the aggregate economic state might be driving a lot of it. Um, you know, the authors mentioned this paper by Pastor and Borsas, Bors, uh, Borsas, uh, you know, which is showing that fund outflows really uh, increased dramatically during the COVID-19 market crash. So this is something that by itself, that these funds are really important in the equity space would just drive up equity volatility. Um, and so there's a causality question there that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, and you know, um, Gormson and Cohen, and then we have a recent paper where we tried to understand this V-shaped trajectory um, from March to April of 2020. And you know, bo both papers concluded that it's really driven by plot, most plausibly by wild fluctuations in the pricing of stock market risk um, rather than uh, sort of the quantity of risk. Now, some of that may be correlated with the COVID uncertainty shock, but you know, for example, what we did is we did a, um, an announcement effect of the Fed announcements about credit facilities and found that they played an important role in the turnabout. But there was very little credit actually extended by these facilities as of July uh, 31st. And this just suggests that the, the substance was less important than the sentiment that was created by these uh, or that's at least one interpretation and the sentiment created by these, um, these announcements, taking us back to a potential role for um, belief, sentiment, tangible information, what, whatever you want to label it, um, admittedly harder to measure. <clears throat> but, and then there's the question of causality. So one could ask, uh, given the observation in the second bullet, does uncertainty cause fund flows or the other way around? Um, uh, you know, uh, the volatility, if they're holding, 44% of the equity market, the volatility and flows should by themselves, if they're moving around for some reason, such as sentiment, cause stock market volatility. So that's going to have the reverse causality uh, implication for measures that like, the authors use in the paper, like the VIX, the VXO, even, even the EPU, which is driven by um, newspaper articles that are bound to pick up on the words uncertainty uh, when the stock market volatility is high. So 
you know, macroeconomic uncertainty that's tied to macroeconomic variables, that to me seems less obviously endogenous to fund flows. So I, I would have <clears throat> liked to look at macroeconomic uncertainty. So yeah, I'm sort of partial to my own measures of uncertainty. So the authors kindly provided their common fund flows and I threw it into a three variable structural vector auto regression using um, one of our, with Kyle Gerardo and Serena Eng, our measure of macro uncertainty. We also have a measure of financial uncertainty now. That one turns out to be fairly highly correlated with the, the VIX um, over the common sample, like 0.85, um, but it does have some independent variation. And then uh, we put in the common fund flows. I'll use CFF for common fund flows. And we identify this three variable structural VAR using uh, some assumptions that we use in this, this paper here. Um, event and external variable constraints um, you know, without the usual exogeneity assumptions. So external variables think external IV, but unlike an external IV, you don't need to assume that that um, IV is correlated with some shocks and not others. Um, the cost of that is you get these sets of um, solutions. And so that's what these are. These are actually sets of, of impulse responses. But nevertheless, the bounds of these uh, identified sets can be narrow enough to tell you something. And so all I wanted to point out here is that if you look at, we've got three variables and three shocks, we can plot out the effect of uh, each of these variables to each shock. And if you look at what's happening to common fund flows in response to a financial uncertainty shock, this would be very similar if I put the VIX in here, it doesn't seem to be causing fund outflows. In fact, you get sort of this indeterminate result that it causes you know, both positive and negative responses here, but mostly it just hovers around zero. Now, if you look at shocks to common fund flows, well, those do cause financial uncertainty uh, with a positive sign now. So like inflows, which is what you're seeing here, a big shock, um, this, is, this is the normalized, they normalize their common fund flow factor so that an increase means uh, an increase on average in, in uh, inflows. You see that this drives up financial uncertainty. So where is this negative correlation that they document coming from? Well, it's, it's coming from um, the fact that high macro uncertainty which is not core, you know, mutually uncorrelated with these other two sources of variation does cause fund outflows. And that's what you, you see here, right? So a big decline in fund outflows and high macro uncertainty also drives up financial uncertainty. And that's what you see here. And so the channel is operating through macro uncertainty. I actually like this result even better than what they have in their paper now because macro uncertainty just seems uh, less, less obviously endogenous. Okay, question two. What is, so I was trying to think about the marginal ro role of fund flow betas versus primitive betas. So in the model, the equilibrium asset under management and this uncertainty shock or whatever other primitive shocks that you would put in there would seem to be perfectly correlated. So modulo some nonlinearities and in the model, I would have thought that the flow betas and the primitive betas should drive each other out in these cross-sectional asset pricing regressions of you know, average returns on betas. And I put wrong here because I'm not entirely sure what the answer to this is, but that was my thinking about this model. So in reality, of course, there's primitives other than uncertainty. We were just talking about perhaps sentiment probably playing a role in which case an extended version of their model um, in which they had more than one sort of state variable, the flow betas and the uncertainty betas would seem to me to be both priced. Um, is that wrong? I, I'm not sure. I think it would be useful to simulate the model and run these regressions so that we can exactly trace out what the model's relationship is to the specific regressions that have been run in the data. So now to do the second one, you obviously need to augment the model to allow for at least two mutually orthogonal primitive shocks. In the data, if you look at their table five, the flow betas drive out the primitive betas, um, at least the uncertainty betas. So um, that seems un inconsistent with either one or my interpretation, either one or two. And number one, you take the model literally, there's just uncertainty shocks. Um, uncertainty and the common flow betas should then drive each other out. And, and number two, that's obviously more realistic, then both betas should be significant because I take the spirit of the model's fundamental story to be whatever reason for these common fund flows, the mutual funds are trying to hedge against it. Um, it was just unclear to me why the flow betas only were significant and the uncertainty betas were driven out. Um, I just think 
it would be helpful to see some simulations to address uh, what, what is the role of the marginal role of these different exposures um, in their model and how that relates to the empirical results. Okay, question three on the empirical side. Um, so is the cross-section of returns on these you know, well-known characteristic anomaly portfolios explained by common fund flows? So Lena had pointed out, um, you know, it's sort of a puzzle that, you know, I've done a little bit of work with um, Martin Letow and Paolo Manuel, and you know, these mutual funds don't seem to tilt towards the profitable return factors like book to market and others that you, you might expect. And so that potentially consistent with their model. Um, they have shown also that the common flow beta and the book to market ratio are perfectly correlated um, with one another. So, you know, funds have an incentive to tilt towards value stocks after controlling for, for the flow beta. So this doesn't really address the exact question whether the common fund flow exposure helps explain, for example, the value premium, um, or more generally, how much of the cross-section of these equity characteristic portfolio returns do um, these flows explain. So this is just something, uh, they sent us the data. We, I, you know, actually a student did this. Uh, we just poked around a little bit. I'm not even sure if this is the most informative thing to do, but you know, we asked, well, how much of the cross-section of returns on a, a few different equity characteristic anomaly portfolios are explained by the flow beta? Um, we just did a form of Beth regression. We looked at these size book to market, size investment, size operating procedure, um, re, um, based on revenue, uh, reversal, excuse me, and just the total of those. And these are just portfolios that we can download from Ken French's uh, website. But, so what you see is that the, the, these are the factor risk prices and some T stats, Shank and corrected. Greater exposure to fund flows doesn't seem to explain in these data, the high return on anomaly portfolios and conversely low exposure doesn't seem to explain the lower returns. So, you know, I, I don't know entirely if this is the right Type of regression to be looking at, given my questions about marginal uh, effects of different, you know, betas. But I think it would be useful for the authors to think more about this and to, um, in future work, consider what what might be going on with these um, actual equity characteristic portfolios. All right. So two quick things on the model. So. Um, one could ask, what's the main purpose of the model? Um, all the theory results seem to be driven by the fee structure, which is proportional to asset under management. That in and of itself seems to raise a puzzle. Uh, why, why is this the fee structure? The model is not designed to explain the optimal fee structure, as Liam had said. It, instead, it takes the given uh, fee structure, the, the actual fee structure as given. I think that's fine. So, but then once we take the asset under management fee structures given, why do we need the model? One could ask that the empirical investigation would naturally flow from a simple observation on fees. Well, presumably the authors would say, well, the, mo the model is useful to show how the empirical findings can be obtained in general equilibrium and to explain the pro-cyclical fund flows and counter-cyclical alpha. Of course, then the specifics of the model matter. And so I just had two questions. And I, let me just preface this by saying that I am not an expert on funds. In fact, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be the first person or the second or the 10th to, to ask to discuss this paper for that reason. Um, you, I could think of a lot of people to discuss beforehand. So with that in mind, um, let me just ask question one, what about the body of evidence that has been raised by um, you know, uh, by, you know, a couple times already previously today on uh, showing poor performance of the industry as a whole. You know, there are studies on this, actively managed funds um, provide investors with a lower return than passive benchmarks. Um, the, in the paper, there's not much discussion of this. The model presumes that the actively managed mutual funds in aggregate provide value to clients. They cite Burke and Green you know, I, my understanding is that they focus on the cross-section of funds, those with good track records grow, those with bad track records shrink. Um, this is more about the aggregate. The aggregate track record is poor. And so how in the model to account for this? Um, I guess you could lean really heavily on the, the so-called non-pecuniary utility benefit of active management. Um, then there's just a question of what, what is that black box really there for? And so, that's a question. Um, and this, my last question is, is this, I think it's more about semantics and, and this possibly doesn't matter at all. So I want, this is, you know, 
But I got sidetracked trying to understand the various pieces of the payout to clients here and just trying to understand why the value added piece was proportional to asset under management. Um, and I think this is more a matter of semantics of what's in these different pieces and how to interpret them. The decreasing returns is all you know that we know exists um, or that we've seen to think exists is captured here. Um, you know, and so our, should we think about decreasing returns coming entirely as a result of these convex adjustment costs? Or, you know, otherwise without it under this specification, we'd have increasing returns to scale due to the specification of value added. You know, a pastor and standby say, well, decreasing returns at the industry level are caused by um, more funds chasing the same opportunities to outperform. So prices are affected. But I simply couldn't understand whether that would be better modeled as um, with value added and a constant alpha, say, um, you know, value added being a constant here or value added even decreasing itself in AUM along with the convex adjustment cost. This quite possibly doesn't matter for anything, but when you're thinking about this model and what these various pieces are, it, you know, it'd be nice to have some more precise interpretation and know what role this plays, if any. I mean, at the end of the day, you're left with, um, when you divide through by uh, assets under management, a constant here that's additive and does that matter uh, as opposed to some other way of, of modeling <clears throat> the, the sum of these two. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Bottom line, intriguing results. I think this paper makes contributions to our understanding of funds, at least um, what I could glean from my skimming of the literature as in my work on this paper, uh, thinking about this paper. And I think their findings are pointing to fruitful future work. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Sydney, for a great discussion. Um, we'll go straight to some questions. Some of this has been partially uh, discussed in the chat, but I think it's useful to uh, um, to revisit. So the first comment is uh, or question is from uh, John Campbell at Harvard. Hey, John. Oh, hi. Um, whoops. Uh, not sure how to get my picture up, but uh, we see a picture. At least you do. Okay. Oh, good. All right. You see me. All right. <laughs> I can't see me. But um, I was just um, in the chat uh, bringing up an old paper by uh, Jason Karcheski, which came out in the JFQA in 2002. And he talks about mutual funds and their incentives to invest. But what he focuses on is, is the interaction between the aggregate fund flow and the particular funds that get, get inflows. And his, his, his story is based on the idea that there are big inflows when, uh, when the market does well, and then much smaller outflows when the market does badly. That's point one. And then point two is that the best performing funds are the ones that get the inflow. So then his, his story is that fund managers have the incentive to be top performing in a bull market. And the way you do that, of course, is you buy high beta stocks, high market beta stocks. And um, then he uses that to explain the low beta premium, the overpricing of high beta stocks. So it seems to me that effect could easily be incorporated in your model. And in fact, you find that uh, mutual funds do tilt towards high beta stocks. And then in your interesting natural experiment with the natural disasters, it looks as if the disaster uh, causes that tilt to increase, which uh, might be consistent with this story. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how to incorporate that aspect of things. Uh, in other words, where do the flows go? Which funds get the flows? That seems to be important. Yeah, so uh, there are multiple points here. Uh, I think that uh, it's fair to say that we didn't try to explain why market beta uh, has uh, any predictive ability because uh, that is a separate uh, story. And the, the one that you're describing, John, maybe actually what is going on. Uh, one could incorporate into the model, but it's basically adding another target essentially for the model uh, with an additional ingredient. As far as thinking that uh, fund flows go into different funds, uh, that essentially it would basically say that different funds have different betas on the aggregate flows. And uh, one uh, way to do that is to just say agnostic without trying to understand why some funds or even which funds have higher or betas, one can just control for the fund characteristics to look at the time variation 
in uh, uh, fund behavior. So you could control for the betas of different funds being different. Um, but uh, we did look at uh, some fund characteristics related to fund age, size. So it does appear that these characteristics uh, predict the exposure of uh, fund flows to aggregate flows. But again, that wasn't our uh, target to really understand um, where exactly uh, money goes in terms of how different funds load uh, on the aggregate flows. Uh, for our purposes, it's sufficient that on average they have positive loading, but that's a dimension of heterogeneity that one could uh, also use. So that's absolutely right. I mean, there is a counter argument. You see, if you go down this route, it's very, it's very easy to criticize it by saying that, yes, you're telling me that funds have different betas and aggregate flows, and therefore they behave differently. But this is a cross-sectional regression. Isn't the beta and aggregate flows endogenous? And uh, therefore, whatever you're doing from here on is really suspect. So it cuts both ways. But in terms of understanding the structure of the data, I think it's, it's a valid uh, direction to pursue as well. Great, uh, thank you, Leonid. Um, we'll go to the next question, uh, from also from the chat, but it's useful to take it live here, which is from Neil Stoughton at the University of Arizona. Uh, Neil, please go ahead when you're ready. Thanks for taking my uh, question. Yeah, just, uh, you know, this is just a question about the, um, the assumption that there's risk aversion with respect to these fund flows, you know, in some of the work that I've uh, done and, and others, you see this convexity and, uh, you know, in order to, uh, you know, convexity, especially with respect to ranks of performance. And if you think about it, uh, you know, when there's convexity to payoffs of managers, there's going to be a, um, you know, the only way you're going to reach there is by taking risk. If you don't take uh, risk, especially with respect to idiosyncratic risk, you're not going to reach the, the top decile or, or a demi decile or whatever performance where the payoff is found. So that seems to go against the story in the model about risk aversion with respect to fund flows, as far as I could tell. I would say that uh, these two are not inconsistent. Um, essentially, we're talking about different pieces of the flows. This uh, story that uh, there is a convex relation between fund flows and uh, between fund flows and idiosyncratic component performance. That would explain the idiosyncratic component of flows. And that would suggest that unless risk aversion kills this effect, they may actually behave as a risk-seeking risk agents in the direction of idiosyncratic flows. But what we're looking at are systematic flows. These are the flows that are beyond their control, right? They don't uh, affect them with their own idiosyncratic performance. And so there, if they are risk averse to begin with, that risk aversion is going to remain in their behavior. So I would say that these are perfectly consistent with each other. Now, we don't uh, look at uh, what behavior the idiosyncratic piece induces. Uh, that would essentially boil down to hedging your own idiosyncratic performance. So that does affect the portfolio, but it wouldn't lead to pricing of aggregate shocks. It would essentially just change their incentives. Are they risk averse or risk loving when they choose their portfolio? But as far as the aggregate shocks, again, they would be still risk averse with respect to those, given their underlying risk aversion to begin with. Because that's going to be absorbed in the relative performance, kind of, in the relative piece. So, so on the surface, this doesn't strike me as inconsistent uh, at all. It could add another dimension to this, but it will be kind of orthogonal to pricing of aggregate shocks. All right, thank you, Linid. Uh, let's do one more question and then uh... Start wrapping up. So the next question is from uh, Rob Stambaugh uh, from Wharton. Rob, go ahead. Yeah, so sort of, uh, curious about what this direct utility to delegate, how big a role that's playing. It seems like in the absence of that, there'd be no reason for investors to, dele to, to delegate money to active managers. Because it seems like in your model, the active managers would be generating negative gross alpha. You know, for example, in your theorem two, it says they hold the market portfolio plus this hedge portfolio, which I think that would have a negative alpha, the hedge portfolio would have a negative alpha, because it's you know tilting toward the, the lower expected return stocks away from the higher ones. So, so it seems like the, the, these active managers you have in your model are generating negative gross alpha. And uh, so and just it seems like the way you get 
investors to invest in, in actually managed funds is the direct utility for delegation. So, I mean, does your model predict a negative alpha? In other words, is your, is your model sort of one story for why we get negative alphas on mutual funds? Or, I mean, what, what, I'm trying to figure out what's going on there. Yes, okay, thank you, Rob. So basically, uh, I wouldn't say predict because it's pretty hardwired uh, at the end of the day, uh, right? Once you have this utility from delegation, it's really easy to get a negative alpha. Uh, negative alpha would be positive. It's like, why do you get a negative alpha, right? So you need a piece and uh, we do it in reduced form. So that's fine. But uh, there is one piece that you're leaving out here, which is that we do assume that these active managers, they do have a gross alpha that they're creating, that do add value at the expense of direct investors. So they lose value because they're hedging, but they do add value to begin with, which means that if we get rid of the money doctor's effect, if we get rid of this utility of delegation, what would happen is that the amount of funds delegated would be determined in equilibrium. So on the margin, investors would be indifferent between managing directly and uh, basically doing uh, just forming their own portfolio and then losing this transfer to the active managers or delegating and then losing something uh, on the hedge, right? That these managers do, but then gaining that uh, alpha. So, so in equilibrium, they, they'll they be getting, indifferent. And sorry, how, how are they getting positive alpha by holding the market plus this hedge portfolio? Just, I mean, you're, you have a theorem that says they're, the active managing portfolio is the market plus the hedge portfolio. So, so how does that generate positive gross alpha? Uh, it's a reduced form assumption that the, the managers are able to extract value uh, directly from the direct investors. It's not computed. But the direct investors are holding the mean variance efficient portfolio. So they can't have a negative alpha. I mean, the alphas have to add up across these three parties to zero, right? I mean, the weighted average alpha. So, uh, so the direct investors are holding the mean variance efficient portfolio. So they have, they have a positive alpha with respect to the market. It seems like the active managers are generating negative gross alpha with respect to the market. But but you've got people nevertheless investing with them because the, there's this direct utility for delegation. It seems like that's your model. All right, so the alphas, they do add up to zero because there is this negative piece that direct investors are facing and it's a transfer to the active managers. Uh, for better or worse, we don't model exactly how that uh, uh, aggregates from the individual security selection. As I said, it's a reduced form assumption, which, uh, it is what it is. You could imagine multiple stories that could uh, support this kind of transfer that active managers are able to do better than the passive direct investors. But if you want to microfound it, it would really complicate the model. Like for example, if you look at the uh, uh, information asymmetry models like Grossman Stiglitz, you could easily get uh, informed uh, investors doing better than the rational uninformed. So there is a transfer there. But if you go down that road, then you need to rewrite the whole model with that ingredient. Uh, you could uh, say that, well, if I don't want to delegate, I'm just going to hold an index fund. But then the index fund is going to follow the index. And by being slave to the index, they may give up some uh, uh, value by essentially demanding uh, immediacy. Whenever they trade, they want to follow the index. So someone who is able to deviate can provide liquidity to the index funds do a little bit better. So that's a very different story with frictions. Again, to incorporate that into the model, it would really complicate it. So it's a brute force device. One could say it may be aesthetically jarring, but it is what it is. It's a transfer to the funds and uh, it just gives an incentive to the, um, these um, fund clients to delegate. The reality is one could kill it. They would still delegate because of this uh, utility thing. But since you asked what would happen when you switch off the utility piece, in equilibrium, there would be a point of indifference uh, where they can either manage directly or delegate and face this kind of um, eroded performance due to the hedge. Uh, that, that doesn't mean that the alpha in equilibrium has to be negative. Uh, it's going to be determined based by this indifference condition. And what we get really from this uh, utility piece is that we don't need to solve for that interior point where investors are indifferent between delegating or not. We're always at the corner where they delegate all of their assets to the funds. So that uh, is uh, the benefit of that assumption. But again, if I really are interested in why the net alpha will be negative in equilibrium, this is not an explanation. There is an ingredient that gives you that, which is that they're getting utility from delegating. So despite of the negative equilibrium alpha, they would still do it.